The periodic table didn't just appear on our desk fully formed. Definitely not. It's the result of centuries of chemists organizing, guessing, debating, and maybe being just a little extra. Let's meet the scientists who shaped the ultimate cheat sheet of chemistry. Let's go back to the year 1789. Meet Antoine Lavoisier, often called the father of modern chemistry. Before him, the world of elements was kind of a mess. People had all sorts of ideas about what stuff was made of, but not many rules. Then came Lavoisier with a question. What if we listed all the elements we know and grouped them by what they have in common? So in his book Elementary Treatise of Chemistry, he listed 33 elements which at the time was already impressive. And instead of tossing them all together, he sorted them into metals, nonmetals, gases, and earths. Now, was it perfect? Not really. It was basic but it was a start. Fast forward a few decades, chemists started noticing some strange patterns. Enter a German chemist named Johann de Beriner, who spotted something that made people raise their eyebrows. So de Beriner, he wasn't trying to change the world, he was just curious. He noticed something odd with certain elements. They seemed to come in groups of three, what he called triads. Not just random trees but elements that look alike, reacted similarly, and even had a cool math trick behind them. Here's how it worked. Take the alkali metal triad lithium, sodium, and potassium. If you take the atomic mass of lithium and potassium and find the average, you get something close to the atomic mass of sodium, the middle element. He found this pattern in other triads too, like the alkaline earth metals, halogens, and calcogens. It was like nature was dropping hints, hey, these elements are kind of related. But of course, not everyone was convinced. First of all, there just weren't enough triads. Sure, some group work like chlorine, bromine, and iodine, or calcium, strontium, and barium, but most elements, they didn't fit into these tidy little sets of three. And scientists, they weren't looking for a sometimes it works kind of system. They wanted something universal, a pattern that all elements could follow. Second problem, the Beriner couldn't really explain why it worked. Why did the atomic masses average out like that? Why were those three elements so similar? He had a pattern, but no theory behind it. So in the end, it was more like a fan observation than a full scientific breakthrough. Alright, fast forward again, this time to 1864. A chemist named Jan Newlands was flipping through the list of known elements trying to make sense of them. And suddenly, something clicked. Something musical. He noticed that if arranged from lightest to heaviest, every eighth element seemed to share similar properties with the first one, kind of like a repeating tune. So he called this idea the law of octaves. Yup, just like the musical scale, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Let's try it with this part of his table. Start with lithium, then move forward one element at a time like a musical scale. And we land on Na or sodium, which, surprise, acts a lot like lithium. Same goes for beryllium, magnesium, and calcium. Every eighth element kind of rhymed with the one before. But not everyone thought it sounded great. Well, scientists, first off, they thought it was way too musical for science. It just didn't sound serious enough for the scientific crowd. Then there was the problem with heavier elements. His pattern worked for the lighter ones like lithium, sodium, and potassium. But once you reach the heavier elements like beyond calcium, the tune got pretty off-key. It just didn't fit as neatly as he hoped. And speaking of fitting, Newlands was so eager to make his theory work, he squeezed in elements that didn't really belong. There wasn't even room for future discoveries. No empty spots for elements that hadn't been discovered yet. He was on the right track, but the world of science wasn't quite ready for his rhythm yet. 
Now after Newlands hit a few wrong notes, it was time for someone to take things to the next level. And that person was Dmitry Mendeleev. In 1869, Mendeleev decided to throw a little order into the chaos. Instead of relying on musical patterns, he organized the elements by atomic mass. He also grouped elements by similar properties. But here's the kicker. He didn't just organize what was known. He predicted missing elements. For this reason, many call him the father of the periodic table. And hey, element 101? Mendelevium, named after him, proving just how influential his work really was. Here's a portion of Mendeleev's periodic table. It might look a bit different from what we're used today, but this was the start of something huge. You'll notice he arranged the elements in rows and columns. The columns are called groups, and there are eight main groups in this version. Here are the elements of group 1, group 2, group 3, and group 8. Each group contains elements with similar properties like metals and non-metals. Mendeleev's table wasn't perfect. But here's where Mendeleev really blew everyone away. He didn't just organize the elements, he had predicted the ones that were missing. He left blank spaces in his table, confidently labeling them with names like Eka Boron, Eka Aluminum, Eka Silicon, and Eka Manganese. Eka was his way of saying this element should behave like the one before it in the table. And guess what? The missing elements he predicted? They were eventually discovered and they turned out to be scandium, gallium, germanium, and technetium. He wasn't just guessing, he had nailed their properties and placement. Now here's something really interesting. Mendeleev said elements should be arranged by increasing atomic mass, right? From lightest to heaviest. But then, take a look at this. Iodine actually has a lower atomic mass than tellurium. But Mendeleev put iodine after tellurium anyway. Why? Because iodine's properties match better with the group it landed in. Same thing happened with cobalt and nickel. Cobalt has a slightly higher atomic mass, but Mendeleev placed it before nickel. Again, just to keep the similar properties lined up in the right group. So even though he valued atomic mass, Mendeleev chose chemical behavior over the numbers. And honestly, that idea turned out to be a genius decision. It showed he understood the bigger picture even if the science wasn't fully there yet. But there were still a few puzzle pieces that didn't quite fit. Why did some elements break the atomic mass rule? What was the real order hiding beneath it all? That's where a young scientist named Henry Mosley steps in. In 1913, British scientist Henry Mosley began using X-ray experiments to study the elements more deeply. And what he found, it changed everything. Instead of organizing elements by atomic mass like Mendeleev, Mosley discovered the real key, atomic number. That's the number of protons in an atom's nucleus. When he arranged the periodic table based on increasing atomic number, suddenly all the strange mismatches disappeared. Everything just fit. This led to what we now call the modern periodic law. The properties of elements are periodic functions of their atomic numbers. In simpler terms, when you line up the elements by atomic number, their chemical behavior starts to repeat in a predictable pattern. It's like a rhythm. Same notes, different octave. Sadly, Mosley's story was cut short. In 1914, he joined the British Army during World War I, and in 1915, he passed away in battle. He was only 27 years old. It was a tragic loss, especially for the scientific community. Mosley didn't just reorder the table, he helped confirm and complete it. First, his atomic number experiments confirmed the existence of missing elements like 43 and 61, which would later be discovered as technetium and promethium. Then, he even predicted elements 72 and 75, proving the table still had room to grow but only in the right places. And here's the best part. Mostly showed that from elements 13 to 79, there were no more gaps, no missing pieces, no mysteries. With atomic numbers as the guide, everything finally made sense. This marked the end of the guessing game. Thanks to Mostly, the periodic table finally had order, logic, and rhythm. And just when you thought the periodic table was done evolving, enter Glenn Seaborg. 
In 1945, these scientists gave us the modern table, the one we know today. He noticed something odd about the elements with atomic numbers 89 to 103. They didn't quite fit into the main table. Their properties were unusual compared to the others. So instead of forcing them into place, he pulled them out into a separate row. But Seaborg didn't stop there. Between the 1940s and 1950s, he discovered plutonium and co-discovered other super heavy elements beyond uranium. And get this, in 1980, he actually turned bismuth into gold. Not practical, but scientifically, he made it happen. And in 1997, Glenn Seaborg got one of the rarest honors in science. Element 106 was named Seaborgium while he was still alive. That never happens. It was like the periodic table tip its hat to him. Before Seaborg, the periodic table looked a bit cramped. The F-block elements, the lanthanides and actinides, were squeezed into the main body like puzzle pieces that didn't quite fit. It worked, sort of, but it made the table feel crowded and confusing to interpret. So Seaborg had an idea, pull them out and give them space to breathe. And just like that, the modern periodic table as we know it was born. It wasn't just a small design change, it was a major step in organizing the building blocks of matter. So the table we use today, it's not just a chart. It's a collection of stories and Seaborg's chapter helped shape the final look. From curious patterns to trides and tunes to bold predictions and powerful experiments, the periodic table didn't appear overnight. It was built slowly, layer by layer, by scientists who asked the right questions and sometimes the weird ones. They didn't always get it right. Some were left at, others were ignored. But each one moved us a little closer to the beautiful order hidden in the elements. And today, we don't just use the periodic table. We use it, we teach it, test it, expand it, and keep it growing. Because chemistry isn't just about memorizing symbols. It's about discovery, it's about patterns, and it's about people bold enough to look at the known and say, Let's figure this out. This is Learning with G. See you in the next one.